Clifford Meacham here. Clifford Meacham uh, works with Crew, and he'll tell you all about what Crew does. Clifford. Outstanding. Everybody, thanks for coming out. Thank you for having me, Suzanne, Peter. It's a wonderful opportunity to speak with you all and explain to you how solar works and how solar actually connects with gardening and the flora and fauna of Florida. Now, in particular, I work with a company called Crew, Clean Renewable Energy Worldwide. We are a member-owned cooperative of people that educate everyone on solar power and help facilitate them in getting solar power for their homes. Particularly, we focus on rooftop solar, and I'm an energy advisor that helps streamline that whole process. Because a lot of people, you know, they think about it, and they talk about it, but then all of a sudden, it's paralysis to analysis. There's so much information out there that most people end up not doing anything because they're just overwhelmed by it. So I do my best to make it easy, simple, and understandable. So now, uh, we are focused on solar power in Southwest Florida. In particular, I have an initiative that's to that is to install 10,000 solar installations between here or in the whole Southwest Florida region. So now, that's including Cape Coral, Fort Myers, the 10 city area between here and all the way up to uh, Punta Gorda. So the idea is that we want to expand and further push solar power in the Sunshine State because as you look at a comparison, solar in Florida has the third highest potential in all the United States. But states like New Jersey, who ranks significantly lower, has about five times as much solar as Florida. As a state, we only have about 12,000 solar installations in the, in the entire state. New Jersey has 43,000. And that's old numbers. They continually push solar and advance it. So we just need more people to actually get information on it, look into it, and find out how well it can work for them. Now, personally, I am on the executive committee for the Sierra Club, so I do have an environmentalist heart for everything's uh, conservation and everything to find a sustainable balance between technology, people, and the environment. And I also do uh, some lobbying with a group called Rethink Energy Florida. So I've actually up in Tallahassee in January speaking with legislators about how to incorporate more solar energy, how to advance the prospect of conservation and sustainability with our environment. Because when everything gets polluted, there's no garden available. Yes, sir. There is the story that there is active resistance against adoption of photovoltaics. Are you going to elucidate on that at all? Or is the story just a story? Or no, there's, there's definitely a story with that. And the story goes back many, many years before I even came into the whole solar game. So the main thing about it is there's a status quo. And any status quo doesn't want to change. And p humans in nature are resistant to change. Put in a corporation and that resistance becomes even greater. There are particular powers that be that have established a system of energy production that have been among the lowest costing mm -hmm. in the United States. True. So we have very low energy pricing. Prior to these last five, six years, the gap was so huge that it just wasn't viable for the average person. Now in the last five, six years, the price of solar has come down over 60%. So now there's that resistance that starts to come in. There is some adaption, adaptation and some adoption by the powers that be and the special interests and the utility companies, but it's not to the level that we would like to see. So that's where we can all take part in expanding that and moving forward with it. And by all means, anybody that has a question on anything I'm going over, put your hand up. This is a free forum or free open space, so if there's something pertinent or something that's you know, not too poignant to a, a point, I can definitely expound on that. We will have a question and answer time at the end, so that way people can ask more specific questions to particular situations. All right? But one thing about the legislative and the lobbying aspect of it is it takes involvement. The senators, the representatives, the Congress people that we have do listen to people. But it's a matter of most people don't say much. Or it's only a small group that keeps saying the same thing and then they start to get deaf to that one group that keeps going in there. So the more people that help out, chime in, the better we can do and the more we can advance solar power. 
So now I'm first going to cover how solar works. Um, then we're going to go into an off-grid and grid intertie systems. So being completely standalone and being connected to the utility grid. And then a lot of people have heard about the process called net metering, where you get paid for the energy that you produce. I'm going to explain that. And then batteries, residential and commercial levels for that. So just starting out, when we look at the energy production, we currently have what's referred to as a centralized power station. There's a power station that in our area of Lee County, 70% of our power is from natural gas. So what they do is they pump in natural gas, start burning it, that heats up water. That water spins a turbine, creating electricity. The electricity goes from miles and miles and miles across the power lines to our homes, and that's how we get our energy. Now, when we talk about distributed power that's through solar, what we do is we take silicon crystals that are put into a sheet and we place it on your roof. Through what's called the photoelectric effect, you get a flow of electrons, creating a direct current flow. Now, the power in our homes is using alternating current. So after it comes from the solar panel, it goes to an inverter, and the inverter turns it into alternating current, powers our dishwashers, our microwaves, and all of our modern conveniences. And then it connects to a meter. And that meter is going to see how much power is coming from the solar panels. And then when the sun goes down, it's going to be connected to the utility to see how much power is being used there. Mm -hmm. Now, in the example you can see here, you have your solar panels on the roof, going down to your inverter that converts it, goes to your uh, junction box for your home, and goes to your appliances. And then there's what's referred to as a bi-directional meter. That way it can change, it can find out what the flow is going in the in two directions. What, what's implied is that it's 110, 120 as far as the, the voltage goes. It's, Correct. Oh, okay. That's the standard utility. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. uh, the 120 volts that are coming into your mm -hmm. line, and that's what the inverter matches the direct mm -hmm. current coming to. Mm -hmm. So now each home is going to have a different profile depending on how many solar panels they have there, but the inverter is going to convert it to the amount of energy, the electricity that they need uh, for that. So now this is what's called a grid interconnected system. Mm -hmm. A grid interconnected system means you're still connected to the utility. Most people, when they think about electricity and going solar, they're like, I want to get off grid, man. Mm -hmm. Get the electric company. I don't want to touch them at all. Right. You know? <laughs> However, as we mentioned pr uh, previously, the powers that be have established a system where it's virtually illegal, borderline illegal, borderline impossible to actually go off grid. All right, just because the statutes and resolutions that have been put forth say you have to be connected to a utility. All right, so in the case that somebody doesn't have to go off grid, is not able to go off grid. Now, there are times when somebody's in a rural portion of town or they don't have electricity connected to the home that it is possible to go off grid, but that's generally not the case for 99.9% .9 of people. So in those other cases, we do what's called blacking out where a home is creating enough power that they don't have to use the utility company and that they can go ahead and produce enough that it's offset by anything that they might use from the utility company. So they're not actually giving anything to the utility company for that. So that's the off-grid application. Off-grid means you're not connected to the utility at all. Grid inner tie is what the standard installation is and that's where persons connect to the utility at night and that's where they draw their power and then their solar panels put power into the grid during the day. So now, a lot of people... Oh, I'm sorry, question. Um, so is there a battery storage in the interconnector area or is the battery storage with the power company? Well, with the interconnected system, the, batteries, the battery storage or the electricity is with the utility company. Okay. In an off-grid application, somebody would have to have batteries right. to store exactly. the electricity. And then I'm just about to touch into right after I go over the island thing, because it connects right into this, okay. how the batteries come into play for a grid interconnected system. Now, since the system is connected to the utility company, when the utility company goes down, the solar array also goes down, unless they have batteries. So okay, what yeah. I was saying with that is, since we are connected to the utility company, if the sun is down, there's no power, obviously. But if the utility company is down, as far as, the, like during Irma, the utility company was yeah. no power available. The solar array also shuts down for safety. Ah. So when the sun comes back up, the solar panels wouldn't be producing electricity for the reason 
that if you have a down power line, you have that electricity coming from the solar panels that's going to be going into that down line and somebody can get hurt. We have a lot of water in, the, in areas and that down line can end up hurting somebody. Most of all, it can end up hurting the technician that's working on reconnecting the lines. So that's what's called islanding. So when you don't have batteries on your system and you're using the utility as the, as the storage, utility goes down and your system also goes down for safety. All right? And that is a necessary evil, all right? We don't want the technicians that are working you know, feverishly to restore that power getting hurt. We also want, don't want people that are around the line to get hurt. So now that comes to the next play, adding batteries so you can avoid that island eff islanding effect. So now, for batteries, most people have heard of the Tesla Powerwall. It's a wonderful application for battery storage. The big advancement that Tesla did was a rethinking of a standard battery array uh, or battery string. Typically, you had what would look similar to a car battery, just bigger, referred to as a deep cycle battery. And those batteries are generally very heavy and bulky, you know, difficult to move, and it would take many of them to store the electricity. What Tesla did was grab the little rechargeable batteries that we have in standard appliances, little race cars, children's have remote controls and such, and took a bunch of them and put them into the power wall. So that system is going to have several hundred to several thousand batteries in one place, which makes them lighter and easier to work with. They're rechargeable and they'll recharge faster, and they'll also last longer than the standard deep cycle battery. So his just thinking outside of the box for another application of existing technology is what really created that that, that potential for everyone else. And then everybody else kind of got in the game. Mercedes is making a battery. There's a company out of Germany called Sonnen. Their eco battery is also into play. So now what somebody would do is have one of these batteries attached to their home and store their electricity for when the utility is not there. It would be something that would actually also be used daily. When the sun goes down, instead of using the utility, they would actually use the batteries. And then when the sun comes back up, it charges the batteries and they stand, take their standard power. So then they're using the utility even less. But you'd still be on the utility, because you, you have to be on the utility. You would be connected. You'd be connected. Connected to it, but you wouldn't necessarily be using any of their electricity. Because okay. your solar panels are powering you sufficiently <coughs> for your home during the day, and your batteries are powering you sufficiently at night. So you essentially not include the utility at all. Are you putting the current from the batteries back through the inverter and creating 110, 120? Or, or Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, everything works normal. Because I've heard of 12 volt systems, you know, from old lead acid batteries and so right. on. In an off grid application, it's a lot easier than using an inverter and a lot more cost effective than adding an inverter to make everything direct current. That's what I'm saying. So you can have a direct current light that's 12 volt, a direct current light that's 24 volt, 48 volt, depending on the size of their system. Mm -hmm. That doesn't come into play too much for an interconnected system because everything going to the inverter pumps out standard AC volts. Now, in many of those applications, it's in a rural setting where you don't have to worry about converting to AC, so it's easier to get an infrastructure put in for direct current, but to rewire an entire home for direct current just doesn't really work mm -hmm. as well, particularly because a home is so large. Direct current doesn't like distance. So the further it has to travel, the heavier gauge wire, the thicker wire you have to use. So that's why it's not used in a home. But we don't use direct current because just to run from your bedroom to the kitchen, the electrical wiring becomes too cumbersome and expensive. Now, when you're talking about a cabin, 400,000 square feet, something along those lines, it's definitely an option to take into account. So that'd be the, system, the difference on that. So now, with the batteries, what you'd be looking at are what's referred to as days of autonomy. The battery system needs to be sufficiently large enough to cover you for at least, well, for whatever power you want to do. Ideally, we don't want any change in our lives. You know, we want to have enough storage that we can go just as everything's normal, batteries right there. But the more storage you have, the more expensive it gets. Now, most cases, Alerta, we don't see more than three days without sunlight. So two days of autonomy will be sufficient. That would be the ideal, all right? But again, two days without sun is still pretty rare or isn't, isn't very common, it's probably a better way to say it. So somebody could still get by with one day of autonomy. And if they're like, hey, I just need to keep everything cold and I'll turn on a couple fans, 
They can go to emergency power where the system will be able to make them comfortable without having you know, large appliances able to function. And then they would just go with a smaller battery bank for that. So you have the different levels. You know, emergency power, a full day of autonomy, the ideal of two days, or if somebody really wants to get paranoid and wants, you know, ready for the apocalypse, they can go for <laughs> weeks and such. You know, if you're building a bunker, it might be the case to go with. But it's main thing to look at is the cost effectiveness for the individual. You know, so that the standard is no batteries, and that's very little change to a budget. In many cases, it's going to be a savings. So now it gets into net metering. So either somebody is producing enough power from their solar array and they're pumping it back into the, into the grid or they have batteries and all their excess power is going into the grid. The utility company is going to take that electricity and divert it to a neighbor down the street, take it in for overflow or do what, put it wherever they need it to go. So because they have the electricity that you produce, they compensate you for that. Now on average in, in this area of Flo the, in Florida, power costs about ten and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Net metering is going to give you close to a nickel, four point seven cents, somewhere in that range. Anybody that's had a solar array, they can tell from their situation how much it's getting, but it also depends on how much power they're producing for the utility company. So they're getting a check back, or they're getting credits back for that extra energy. Now, don't get ahead. let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's not going to be enough to pay off the system. It's not going to be enough to you know, make it truly worthwhile in most cases, a couple hundred here, you know, maybe 50 bucks, somewhere that, in that range annually. But a lot of people just like the idea of getting money back from the utility company, so that makes them happy either way. In my personal opinion, I think net metering is gonna be on its way out. The special interest in utilities have been, you know, doing their best to curtail it for years, and it's, in many municipalities across the country, it's, it's been eliminated. So I can see that's still the same thing coming to Florida, but I really don't feel it's necessary as far as net metering because the amount of savings that a person's home can get can realize from solar will far exceed anything they get back for net metering. But aren't they making money on it? I mean, if if we're providing them with power, mm -hmm. they're making money on it. They because then they don't have to use as much. Right. Uh, of the oil. It's more of an avoided cost. Oh, okay. All right. So what they don't have to do is turn on what are referred to as peaker plants. During the day, the utility company has to be able to produce 120% of the expected power demand. So now once they get close to that 100%, they turn on an extra turbine that's generally running coal or biomass, burning that, so that way they can cover that gap. Now when they don't have to turn on that, tur that turbine because they have the extra power, they're saving money but it's not something that's directly realized. It's just an avoided cost. So they're not saying, oh, yeah. well, we okay. moved this much here, right. so that. So they didn't have to turn this on for X amount of time. It's also more difficult for them to predict how much savings was there until the end of the year when they can do a total audit of the power. So they're not exactly going through the hassle of saying, oh, I guess we owe you $2. It just really wouldn't be yeah. time, time effective. Uh, co cost you know, effective. Co wouldn't be cost effective for them and it would be really time consuming just to go through all that rigmarole and say, hey, here's right. five bucks that we can give you for the power you produce. <laughs> it's just not on the scale that way. Now, in the future, what I would see and what I hope to realize, I was gonna touch on this in the end, but is entire neighborhoods that have solar panels and then the utility company, they just manage that flow of power. So the utility company doesn't necessarily have to create any power on its own. They're just in charge of managing the power that all the homes are producing, which would be a much a much more integrated system, which will be all of us playing a part, a more robust and secure system, because if one portion goes down, the other portion can, can produce for it. That's the ideal, and, but that's still gonna take considerable time before we have enough solar in the area where that's truly viable. It's referred to as the virtual power plant. But, hey, everyone counts, and we, every home that installs solar moves a step towards that. So that goes into our net metering and our batteries. <laughs> So now, the solar potential in Florida, you can see from the, uh, this is referred to as a heat map. The darker the color, the more solar energy uh, is coming to that area. Florida down here in the corner is ranked number three behind Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and an area right there. So that means we get about five and a half to 
six hours of usable sunlight. Just because the sun's up doesn't necessarily mean that the solar panels are getting the best light, depending on the angle. Particularly early in the morning, that the sun is so low in the sky that the solar panels aren't getting enough light to really be effective. And then as you get towards the evening, you're going to get the same effect. So there's only about a window of six hours that the solar array can produce energy for somebody. And the more orange we go, the better we're going to do. So as a state, pretty much all of the state has great potential. In our region, we get 266 days of sunshine. <laughs> all right, and that's, count, that's not counting partial sun. That's total clear, no clouds in the sky, everything's working great Love, uh, levels then that leaves 99 days of partly sunny to not sunny. And as we know in Florida, as we can see now, wait 10 minutes, the weather will change. <laughs> so we have many days that even of those 99 that are remaining, many of those are still usable days for solar. So we probably have close to 300 to 320 days of good usable sunlight with 266 being the prime. So tremendous potential. But we have states like New Jersey that are kicking our tail as far as use and utilization. And we really like to see that turn around. Now, the key point about that is, I mentioned earlier, 70% of our electricity is generated through natural gas. The big boom since the early 2000s and late 90s has been using fracking to get that gas. Yes, <laughs> I'm not a fan of fracking. We particularly have the Sable Trail Pipeline. Many of you have probably heard about the protests and fights we had, yeah. had for that. Yeah. 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 Much of that pipeline is completed, and that pipeline itself, 98% of that natural gas won't even be used here. All right, it's primarily for export. All right, so I'll take that energy, pipe it through Florida, and send it over to Europe or somewhere else around the world. All right, so only about 2% will be used for that. And if we continue with our pace for solar, virtually none of it. Which is a good thing in one respect, but it's very potentially damaging in the other respect. Because the fracking problem is they have to do exploratory drilling. And they have to build derricks and wells to absorb that, to collect that natural gas. And it takes hundreds of those wells placed throughout the land, land mass of Florida to absorb that. Dr. Anthony Ingraffia of Cornell University calculated the numbers. According to the United States Geological Survey, there are only about 352 million barrels of, barrels of oil in Florida. All right, so that's that they got every potential area that they see. All right, there's 1.6 tetracubic feet of gas if they got every area and used 100% of the potential. That oil would only last 17 days of US consumption. That natural gas would only run the country for 23 days. And that's if they got 100% of it. And to get that, you have to have the wells, you have to have the derricks, you have to have the pipes to move all that. So there's a lot of infrastructure going on beyond that, a lot of dump trucks and earth movers that move in that. And anybody that's been following the Sable Trail has seen a lot of the sinkholes that pop up from the frag. So we have further ecological potential damage coming in from that, from doing that. So it really behooves all of us to look at going solar for that. Now, now we're getting close to what's important to the gardeners. And you all here is the water. Fracking uses tremendous amounts of water that has to be pumped down into the ground so we can push the sand or it can push the acid going through. And uh, let me touch on the point. We do use the term fracking as an all-encompassing description of this process of acquiring natural gas and oil. Fracking itself is literally when they make a hole in the ground, drill to the side, and then put explosives down there to crack or fracture the rock in that area. And then the natural gas seeps out and the oil comes through. Florida doesn't have that strong granite and basalt rock formations under it. A lot of it's limestone, sandstone, yeah, yeah. 
and a porous material, a porous rock that we have through there. It's like a, a giant sponge, but made of rock. So now when they do those explosives, that sponge absorbs the energy, doesn't come out effectively. So what they do is called matrix, matrix acidizing. Now what you find is that sandstone and limestone, they're rather brittle, and a little bit of acid will actually get them to dissolve and move away, move out of the way so that they can flow through with the natural gas or the oil. So the term fracking is there, but the term fracking isn't true to what's going on in Florida. And I, I mentioned that because when I went and lobbied up in Tallahassee, I was told, well, we don't do fracking in Florida. So mm -hmm. this is, yeah, which literally is true, but the common understanding is that all this is fracking and they're splitting hairs on that so that legislation can go one way or mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. And that's how the system works, and we all do what we can to go against that. But I make that point just to point of clarification. What was the term that you used? Matrix acidizing. All right, so they actually melt away that rock. Now, the problem that we see is that that acid doesn't just stay in the ground. It's going to seep. We've been told that the acid gets used up goes to equilibrium and then essentially becomes inert, so it's not a problem. Plus it's below the water table, so it's not gonna be an issue. Water finds a way, it flows, goes around, and all the water systems connect. So now when there is a particular break or fracture along the lines, even if it's not the bottom and everything's safe down at the bottom, say that along the way a, pro a pipe wall cracks, fails, kind of what happened with deep water rising, but this happens over the land, that acid's still gonna go to the water table or anywhere else along the column. So that potential still lies in that. So it's, it's not something that makes me easy or able to step though, well, I guess everything would be okay. You know, mm -hmm. I'd much rather step left and move forward by not necessarily focusing on fracking, but just focusing on solar and essentially just starve the beast in that respect. You said most of that stuff is getting exported already. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to change it. Not necessarily, but the example that's set by having so much solar, people follow suit. It's my personal opinion that the reason we don't have more solar is that it's still a new idea and it's kind of foreign to people. They don't see it around much. But the more people see it, the more they're willing to accept it. And you get what's referred to as the Jones effect. Well, Johnny down the road got it. I got to get one for Bill since his has got to be bigger and better. You know, uh, that effect will kick in. Plus, the more solar we have, the, le the less expensive solar becomes. And it just because it just doesn't become cost effective anymore to even export natural gas because the pricing has come down so low, and the mass production is what's really made the price fall. Solar panels themselves, between 1970 and solar panels today, really aren't that different. The efficiency has increased, but the material primarily has decreased. So they're able to produce a lot more with a lot less and more efficiently. But overall, a panel from 1970 will work essentially as good as a panel from today, you know, you know uh, taking into account its basic function. Just the panel today is gonna be less silicon to achieve the same job and it'll do it more efficiently with modern electricity, mo or excuse me, modern manufacturing techniques and automation, which has been another key point because humans, we make mistakes. So when we do soldering points, they're not the ideals. Now when a machine does it, it does the same way every time. So it's more consistent as far as the manufacturing quality assurance that we see for that. So that's the great advantage we have with the modern technology for that. But takes more people getting into it. But the water reduction is really the key point about the solar, is that we're not using as much water. And I'm gonna to touch on to that a little bit more, but first I wanna go into a solar field versus a solar roof. A lot of people think of you know, the vast fields of solar panels that we can see right here. In particular, XGCU has 16.1 acres of solar panels. Wow. It covers 80% of their engineering building. And they're looking to do more solar throughout the campus. However, in comparison, what that does is first off, it cuts off usable land. So the area, that 16 acres of solar panels, it's, it's done, it's, that's where the solar is. We don't have it as a 
a flow area for water absorption, we have to put in a sewer system to divert the water around. It's not being absorbed in the ground. It's also, you can't you know, go take a stroll through that necessarily. You're not able to bring the family out and go hiking in that area. That's where the solar panels are. That's where I feel that utilizing the existing space of our roofs makes solar rooftops more advantageous. So that way you can have that garden out there. <coughs> you can have that garden in that section of, that, of land, and you can even put it preserved in that area, with further limiting the impact on the environment and the animals, the flora and the fauna in that region. Right? Now when you're also putting solar panels on the ground, you have to have a more robust footing. The foundation has to be greater. There's what's referred to as the Miami-Dade standard for installation, which says that the panels need, able, need to be able to withstand a Category 5 hurricane or a sustained Category 3 hurricane. To put them in, and I don't know how well you can see in this picture, but these panels have these little spindly metal legs holding them up. That's not the case. <laughs> if you get a chance to go out to FGCU, you'll see that those panels are on big I-beams, big steel I-beams, to make sure they can handle the wind loads that are coming through. And that's great. At the time these were installed, it was the best thing to go. But technology advanced to the point where we use the rooftop as the foundation. So the home holds the panels down, and the home's already designed to withstand the hurricane. And just with the new ordinances that we have for that. And then if those panels go, the whole roof was going to go anyway. So there's nothing that could have been done. The house was going to be a loss. So it's better to use that land for that and then to use it for a solar field. It's also a testament of conservation. When you have solar panels on your roof, your neighbor sees that. People driving by see that. The entire neighborhood see that. Everybody's heard of Babcock Ranch? They've actually gone with the idea of using a solar field to offset the power that that home creates. However, there's another community that's not really talked about called Murata. I want to say it's Lennar Homes that builds the, home, builds the homes in that community. But every home has solar panels on the roof. So they have the option to purchase or lease their panels, their systems. What's the weight per square foot of the solar panels on a roof? Generally about 20 pounds. If a person can stand on it, solar panels can stand there easy because it's a distributed, distributed weight. You'll have several points of contact or racks that go through here, generally on the top and the bottom, or they'll do them vertically. But if you're looking at 20 to 50 pounds of pressure that's put in that area where the panels are. In most, I should say, all roofs that are under 15 years old should be able to withstand that, otherwise the roof needs to be replaced. And that is something that doesn't need to be taken into consideration when looking at getting panels installed. If you're going to be looking to get a new roof, get the new roof, then get the solar panels. A lot of people have new roofs, so it's a good time. Is there a particular type of roofing that would be more amenable to using solar yeah. panels? You know, in other words, not really. Uh, the the, the yes. arrays and the racking systems have oh, the okay. technology advanced to where they're specific to whatever is being used, whether it's tile roof, whether okay. it's slate roof, whether it's metal roof, whether it's shingle roof. There's particular racking systems that are designed for that specific roof style. It used to be that asphalt shingle was the way to go, and if you had tile, just stay away from solar because you don't want to damage that. But they have new ways to attach it that it's not going to damage the existing tile, and it also limits the walking as they're doing the installation on the roof. Also, that way people don't have to also for metal tile? Also for metal. Yeah, metal roofs, they fit right into the seams and go right in between the, the racks so they'll attach to the standing seam for that. So yeah, any roofing system you're using, there's a racking system to go with it. And that's one thing that's been an advancement in that because solar has grown so much, there have been more manufacturers that have created better lines to attach them. Hmm? Uh, my roof, like this one, faces east and west. Are you better off with a south facing roof? Or? South facing roofs are ideal because it's going to cover the arc better. Now what you're looking at, even if you have an eastward facing roof, it's just a matter of it's going to take more panels to use the sunlight that you have available and you may be in an area where it's only 70% of your power instead of 100% of your power. The key is any percentage that you're using is going to be less than what you'd be using from the utility. So you're still going to be saving the environment by using a certain amount of solar. The key is to look at what the best outcome is for your situation for that. So I did have one situation where a gentleman, he had two, his roof was really big on one side, really small on one side. 
guess which side is facing the sun? <laughs> so the little small side, it just wasn't cost effective to put any amount of solar on there. He'd only get about 10% reduction. And for that, we can put it into an energy management system for him that would have been more effective than using solar panels. But the main thing is to look. A lot of people just, oh, no, it can't be. But then they come to find out, well, you get enough sunlight from that arc that you're getting a significant percentage. And people can still save thousands just by putting a small percentage. I actually looked at a uh, commercial space that they were getting a 30% reduction and saved $100,000 over 30 years. Well, pretty, pretty significant, nothing to <coughs> shake a stick at. Now the solar panels are installed on an existing roof, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, I've run into the situation here in Florida when you change insurance companies. Sometimes they say, oh, you've got to get a new roof before we will insure you. Because you, your roof is 10 years old. Yeah. So what happens? Does the solar panel have to be all totally removed, a new roof put on, and then the solar panels put back? That's expensive. <laughs> yes, and that is the case. The panels have to be pulled off, the roof replaced, and then the panels put back on. It's generally not too bad. I've had people that when they were quoted, it was only 500 to 1,000 to take them off and put them back on. Once everything's done, it's really not too bad to pull them off and then check them back together. They're pretty Lego-like in that respect. Once the initial wiring has been drawn, or the panels themselves, they don't really even have wiring directly into them, because each panel connects to the next panel to it. So you don't have to run conduit to it mm -hmm. in that sense. The most impactful thing is the racking system that actually holds the panels to the roof. Now water circulates throughout all these solar panels? You see water? water? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. no. Um, you're thinking of solar <laughs> thermal, okay. which actually is the black panels that you see on many roofs. Oh, and that yeah. uses, yeah, that's what you have on your roof okay. here. That's what uses the thermal heat from the sun to heat the water okay. and circulate the water through. So this is just battery cells that are... This is solar photovoltaic. Okay. Got it. Yeah, this is solar electric yeah. as opposed yeah. to yeah. solar yeah. thermal. So this isn't just heat more, this is putting, utilizing an electric heat pump or your appliances. Solar thermal is just heating water or whatever material you like to heat with that. Hmm? So what about the, Elon Musk came out earlier this year, or last hmm? year, about the, the roof panel. So your actual roof is, is the, the solar, solar tiles. tiles. Is right. that, I mean, is that an option is that coming around is it is it growing it's, it's an option for people but i look at it this way a mercedes is an option and a camry is an option okay most budgets can't afford a mercedes and that's what you're looking at with okay. the solar roof tiles as opposed to a camry which most everybody can afford that the solar roof tiles are really high tech very cool technology i don't get anything against Elon Musk. He's a great guy. He's been great for doing, for helping mm -hmm. out the industry and really been a visionary for what can be done. However, that technology is still so new, it's more expensive. Right. And it's just out of the range <clears throat> of cost effectiveness for most people. The ideal is paying off a system in about 10 to 12 years. But a lot of systems can be paid off in less than that, depending on what a person, how quickly a person wants to do it or what their situation is. But to use the solar roof tiles, 20, 25, 30 years, and then by the time you have it paid off, it's time to get another one, right? You know, so it's not always cost, the most cost effective route. Well, somebody, there's some people that want the latest, greatest, coolest thing, and by all means, you have that liquid funds available. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so if it's the first generation of this, then another five or 10 years, it might be a different story. We'll see. With the, the price coming. The biggest thing that has held back solar roof tiles for the longest is cooling. Since the solar panels are attached to the roof, they don't get enough air circulation mm -hmm. behind them, mm -hmm. and they overheat, mm -hmm. they laminate, and cause problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm eager to see how well his, his tiles perform over time. He does a lot of work, and maybe time will tell that it's gonna come out cost effective, but we won't know until it happens. So yeah, it's just a matter of the expense on those right now. It's just out of the range for everybody. Conventional panels would be the way to go, and you know, least impact to the budget. What is the life, expected lifespan for regular panels? About 30 years. They generally go, uh, most warranties go to about 25, and they expect about maybe another five years out of it. It's kind of like the same idea with a car. A car is generally going to run 10, 15 years, but most people get a new one in five. You know, so 
systems are expected to go 25 to 30 years. We, we look at our systems and scale them on 30 years. So that, so then that really comes down to the cost effectiveness for it. To, because of that foundation, a ground mounted system is going to be about 20% more expensive than using a roof. So it really comes down to a cost effectiveness in an area. And then there's some people just don't like the aesthetic. I'll pay the extra 20%. I don't want the panels on my roof. I want them on the ground. Hey, we do our best to accommodate. I think they look cool. I, that's me. Uh, how fragile are, are the panels? In other words, when we had the hurricane, I had branches and all sorts of stuff that flew across my roof. Is, is a situation like that where we do have the hurricanes quite frequently? Are those going to damage the panels or are they? Generally hard? not. Generally not. What, when you're looking at the solar cells, each panel has about 72 solar cells in it, 60 or 72, depending on which panel it is. And the solar cells themselves have wiring in between each one. So even if something does impact it and breaks that cell, there's enough wiring there that they can still get power through it. So they're pretty robust in that, in that respect. Plus, they also have a layer of glass over the top of them. And Solar World does a cool video where they actually have cars driving over their solar panels, and it's still, you know, really effective. Uh, I can find that video and email it to you, or at least give you the link. It's called Solar World. Solar World. They're a manufacturer of solar panels. You have Solar World, Canadian Solar, First Solar. Uh, solar Tech Universal. There's. There's many, many manufacturers for it. I like uh, Solar Tech Universal because they're actually out of Boca Raton. And they make premium panels, not always cost effective for everyone, but they make a great, a great product. If they look at um, tilting the panel in the morning and then, you know, and even tilting it the other way, you maximize the sun, sun shine. That is an option, but generally not done on a roofing system just because the complexity increases the cost. So you're generally just going with the angle of whatever the slope of the roof is and going from there. And you can get a good estimate as far as what to expect from it, just from the proposals that we could write up for somebody looking into a system. And this isn't a sales meeting. I'm not trying to sell everybody. I'd love to. Anybody that wants to buy one, I'm definitely, I can help you out on that. But I'm here to educate everybody. And ideally, you know, help you do go solar. I, ultimately, I want everybody to go solar. I'd love to be the person to take them down that road. But my primary goal here is to help educate everybody on the options and how it does relate to gardening and conservation and the environment overall. So, now, the ecological impact. I touched base earlier as far as water use. In the graphic you can see here, down at the bottom, you can see how many gallons per megawatt hour are actually used to generate the electricity. Coal is coming in at about 17,000 gallons of water for one megawatt hour of energy. Nuclear is coming in just at about 15,000-ish, right there. Natural gas is pretty low, in, or relatively low, at about 6,000. But solar photovoltaic is all the way down here, a couple hundred. And the main thing that that water is even used for is getting dust and pollen that is settled on the panels off. <laughs> Only about twice a year do the panels need to be you know, rinsed off. And generally in Florida, we get enough rain, it can go down just once a year. The panels are sensitive enough that you can actually see your production diminish if there's too much accumulation. And we have monitoring that's built into the system that lets you know, hey, last year you were getting this, this year you're getting that, probably want to think about getting a cleaning. Or if there's some issue, we can actually see which panel isn't producing well. Mm. So in the effect, you did have something that impacted to the point where it stopped operating, we could see from that one panel. And the system actually takes that panel out of the circuit and goes around it. Mm. So it's really cool technology just as far as that. So water is the key, key resource that, that's going to be impacted by staying with the status quo. I was just listening to a radio program today that said uh, water in particular, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting. Because water rights are what are so critical. You can only go so long, only about three days without water. And if the entire aquifer has been contaminated due to some ecological event or spill, the aquifer that we're on spans from Florida all the way up to North Carolina. All right, so it's referred to as a sunny land trend. A sunny land trend. And that mineral deposit, water, mineral, sediment, 
covers the eight states. So it's very important that we protect that and use that water wisely. We already also have several thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that are moving into Florida, putting further stress on our water system. Sorry, so, that's our clock. Okay. It thinks it's a morning dove. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so we have that water use that's going to be even more impactful as time goes on. So, and we have a lot of salt water intrusion from salt water moving into our areas, which makes it undrinkable water. So we have salt water intrusion. We would have a fossil fuel utilization of the water further impacting. Plus we have more people coming into an area. It's just not cost effective or reasonable to continue stressing our water supply that way. So going solar is a much better route to consider for that. It's also a natural, natural space, natural use for natural space preservation by utilizing the existing space of our roofs. Solar maintains the flora and fauna we have, you know, the protected areas. We don't have bears moving in and crossing paths with us because we didn't have to build that power plant. We didn't need to get that expansion of a pipeline to dispossess or move those animals out of their natural habitat. We don't end up getting, you know, the road kills of cougars crossing the highways because they can actually stay in their natural habitat. We don't have to worry about the burrowing out. You know, uh, Cape Coral has a big push for protecting the burrowing out because a lot of the homes are built in that area as that natural habitat. So now when we actually can leave space open for them because we don't have to have those areas taken up by solar panels and fields or power generation stations, everybody's more, in. it's an adv advantage for everybody. Plus people come here for that flora and fauna. What's Florida is except just a hot, humid, Swamp <laughs> without the plant life. So we really need that. And then also look at greenhouse gas emissions. Plants do thrive on carbon dioxide. That is a true statement. However, you know, they, they end up growing faster than what is normal. So they, don't have, they aren't as robust. So they end up growing large, but they're not as mineral dense as they would be had they grown slower. And we can see that a lot of that effect happening. There's a lot of research looking into that right now as people start moving away from carbon usage. Because that's been one of the arguments is, hey, plants need carbon dioxide, so we should continue pumping carbon dioxide into the planet. <laughs> you know, I don't see that as the best route to go, but you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. But the greenhouse gas emissions would be considerably reduced for that. Electricity generation is one of the key sources of pollution. I don't remember off the top of my head the number, but I want to say it's the number, it's probably the number two uh, source of pollution for energy. Uh, transportation being uh, large freight ships going across the ocean is, I believe, number one, somewhere in that range. But I didn't, I didn't memorize that statistic. I'm going to get back to it. But nonetheless, the greenhouse gases from that could be avoided just by using that. Even if people want to say, hey, well, I'm going to improve the area by getting my electric car. That electric car is still using electricity that has now been dispossessed from the burning petroleum to burning natural gas, coal, or whatever you're using for the local power. All right, so that just offsets the site of the pollution. So a home that has an electric car and solar panels charging it, now we got a winner. Right. <laughs> so we want to do that to make sure we keep all of that protected. So now going into the economics and the tax implications. First off, I'm not sure who remembers the Amendment 4 Amendment 1 fight that we had about two years ago mm -hmm. during the last election cycle. What that was, in, Amendment 1 was an underhanded oh, bill yes. that was not supported by the industry or backed by any citizen groups, but apparently had a lot of funding from special interests. And they were actually portrayed as a grassroots movement, but in reality, were not. Now, we had significant opposition, and as I said, that's actually what I cut my teeth on and got introduced to the solar industry in Florida is during that fight as an activist for that. So now we did have a lot of success for Amendment 4, which actually put into the Florida Constitution that we should have solar panels. We have access to that. All right, so and then further with that, it was a two-step process. The amendment itself passed with 73% approval, and then it had to go into the second step of SB 90, which is Senate Bill 90, being the implementation of Amendment 4. Now what this did is, it maintained the tax exemption for solar panels, re residential solar panels, and it maintained an exemption for property taxes. 
When adding solar to a home, it actually increases the value of your, of your home. But it doesn't increase your property value, your property tax for that home. So SB90 has been great. On a commercial front, though, it offsets 80% of that property tax increase. So they have a 20% property tax increase. And that was largely what Amendment 4 was to do, was to bring in the commercial aspects. So we can get places with big, square, flat roofs, like our grocery stores, our big box stores, strip malls, to encourage them to utilize solar energy. So Amendment 4 went great. And now that started in January of 2018. We also had in that time a Supreme, a Supreme Court decision on a solar tariff. This was a court battle by Sunrun and Saniva. No, Solar World and Saniva. And they are solar manufacturers, and they had operations here in the United States. But they felt they were being undercut by solar panels that were manufactured in China. They said it wasn't fair for Chinese to have lower labor costs and then ship those panels, those cheap panels, over to the United States. And the Supreme Court agreed with them. So what that did is it added a 30% tariff onto panels that are imported. What that means for the average person is that solar essentially price reduction for materials has come close to its peak. So from this point forward, it's going to be more expensive because of the tariff for those imported panels. What it has done is encourage manufacturers to open up operations in the United States. So we'll probably end up seeing more domestic panels and that can balance it out or cause the price, the price reduction to continue with the automated facilities. We, only time will tell for that, but the initial the knee jerk reaction on it is a price increase or a price flattening as far as the panels themselves. You do have other soft costs as far as the labor, as far as the training, that can still get reduced, but those are pretty much at their lowest levels because the game is so competitive. There's still a lot of potential for solar, but we don't have the infrastructure and the solar economy built up to full, fully utilize it. So there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done in that, but that did bring in tariffs on solar energy, on the solar panels themselves. So now. The sales tax exemption means when somebody does get solar, they don't have to pay the extra 6% sales tax on that. That's about the only advantage that we have in Florida. Florida actually is ranked very low on its solar profile because we don't have any renewable incentives. So it's, the pricing is so low that it's actually forced the technology to get better. So it's a double-edged sword. Instead of relying on rebates and incentives like other states have used, the technology had to go to the point where it reached what's referred to as grid parity. Mm -hmm. So now it costs just as much to use solar energy as it does to use conventional energy. And a lot of people don't know that fact because they still have information from years ago that said solar was obscenely expensive, everything had to be done up front, which isn't the case. Now, on the federal level, we do have the solar investment tax credit. What that does is gives you a rebate, excuse me, a credit of 30% of the cost of your system as a credit on your taxes, which a lot of solar companies tout this as, hey, great, you're going to save 30%, so don't worry about the price of the system, it's going to be wonderful. What they overlook, though, is that unless somebody is paying taxes, they can't utilize that credit. If you're getting a refund check, there's no credit to use. So you still end up having to pay that 30%. There's no reduction for it. However, if you had to pay out in taxes, you can use that credit to pay off anything you would need to pay to the government. Another caveat on that is it doesn't have to all be used in one calendar year. Somebody has up to five years to fully use that credit. So if they didn't have to pay taxes this year, but they'll have to pay taxes next year, they can begin using that credit and then further adjust their situation to fully utilize that. The main thing is, again, sit down with somebody and see what your options are. Your tax professional will know best as far as what needs to be paid in regards to taxes and if somebody should be able to take advantage of that investment tax credit. Now, I also mentioned the street value increase is dollar for dollar. So if somebody were to add $25,000 worth of solar to their roof, the value of their home would go up $25,000. So that actually recoups when the home is sold and the new owner has no cost for electricity. 
or depending on what the situation is. The panels can handle 100% of that electricity. So it's a great advantage that they've seen for that. Furthermore to that, there was a study done in Vermont and what they found when every home goes solar, it further helps the home down the street that didn't go solar from that avoided cost from the peaker plants that I mentioned before. So everybody actually gets a savings by each home that does go solar. Plus the environmental aspects and the greenery that we have out there. With lower electricity costs, people can spend more time in their gardens, out in their yards, and doing what they'd like rather than you know, working for the man to pay the bills. All right, and the budgetary impact is virtually zero. It costs virtually the same to do solar as to sta do stand electricity. If somebody currently right now, I get the question a lot, well, how much is it gonna be? Well, I'll ask them, how much are you paying for electricity? Oh, my electricity bill is about 250 a month. Good, your solar will be about 250 bucks a month. It's really reached the point where those match up. Now, it does go off the average because you have different portions of the year, you're gonna get more sun than you get others. Winter, obviously, you get less sun, but you're also using less energy because most people aren't putting on their heat. While during the summer, everybody's cranking their AC, so they're using more energy. So it's a balance, but the average does come out, and then you also have that net metering effect can, make, can bridge the gap of a couple hundred dollars as well. Now the main thing is that grid parity that has been achieved from the advancement in the technology. So now, what to do next? Each one of us is now smarter and more knowledgeable about solar and about solar options. It's our responsibility to reach the next person, to encourage them. I was looking at the group and it said somebody's had solar panels on their house for seven years and they actually talked two of their neighbors into getting solar as well. That is what we love to see. We need to see more of that. We need to get more encouragement from everybody telling everybody else, go get this as well. Follow my lead. If it's not an option for them, hey, I can't do it, but you can, you need to go do it. The way to come against and take down the special interests that have been monopolizing, uh, it's a legitimate monopoly, but it's been centralized in power, is by each of us taking responsibility and taking control of power ourselves. So we need to do it ourselves and encourage our neighbors to follow suit. Get a solar <coughs> assessment. There's a lot of individual aspects to solar. A lot of people tell me, hey, I have a three bedroom, two bath home. How much solar do I need? Well, that's kind of irrelevant. You can take a three, bath, three bedroom, two bath with a retired couple, three bedroom, two bath with three teenagers. Completely different energy profiles, same square footage. So someone needs to sit down and look at how much energy a home is using, a homeowner is using. And from that energy profile, they can determine how much solar is necessary and the cost effectiveness. It's not a complicated process. Uh, I have LCEC for my home. They actually give me my last 12 months of utility usage on each bill. That right there is also my needs. What's LCEC? Lee County what Electrical Co-op. Yeah, LCEC. LCEC or FPNL, I think there's portions of Naples here. Yes. We, we're, yeah, we're FPNL. FPNL, right. Yeah. FPNL, you have to go into your online dashboard and get your historicals yeah. that'll let you know how much power you're using. Oh, we know. Oh, we right. know. There you go. <laughs> well, that's all somebody needs when they look at that, look to do an assessment for you. Hand them that information, they'll take it back, put it in the computer, generally come down a second time and show you exactly how much energy will be needed for solar to do that. But it's a matter of just going through the process. I would love to see each home and each homeowner actually just look at that because in many cases they can see, oh, I'm saving a tremendous amount. For my home in particular, over the 30 year life, we're gonna save about $20,000. I have another proposal I've done for somebody, he was saving $50,000. Just depends on how somebody's using it. I'm pretty conservative. We have all fluorescent bulbs. I always give my wife, hey, turn that light off. I know it's cheap and everything now, but I, every little bit, you know? So look at your situation. What can be done? Many ways that somebody can save is just by doing conservation, changing their bulbs, to more energy efficient bulbs. You know, going with the AC, instead of putting it down to 72, I want the AC up to 76. I keep my house about 78 to 80, but I, I can do that. Put a little fan around, it's gonna be less energy. Ceiling fans work great to move the air around and you don't have to necessarily have all that air conditioned air being pumped through with that extra energy. Saves in the long run because the fan's gonna use less electricity 
than the air cooler, air handler, or AC system. I'm in a condominium. Yes. The board of directors would have a collective cerebral hemorrhage if <laughs> I, I even <laughs> used the term solar. Well, I want to do my part. Do, right. do you have you personally done any outreach with condominium associations? Or Here's one thing: legally, they can't stop. It, but the caveat to that is, I don't want you to go to war with your neighborhood. All right. Um, many cases, when you do have a condominium association, it's if you have enough homeowners that want to go solar, you can take that to the board, and the board is, you know, they're responsible to the people that live there. Do you participate in board meetings as a re technical representative? I would have no problem doing that. I'm actually vice president of my HOA. And I took that position because I want to encourage an open board that's not restrictive and overbearing. That's my opinion on it. But I do go to meetings. Somebody has a board, wants me to come by, say a couple words, put the bug in their ear. By all means, let me know. I'll put it into the schedule and get by and have a talk. And it's a matter of just getting with a couple homeowners, five, six, seven, whatever number. That to me would be the interface at the board meeting, mm -hmm. having the board members at the head table, having 35 homeowners in that room and have you be the spark. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love doing areas like that. Plus, when we have many homes at, at once, there's, it's volume discounts since the, main, the installer mm. can actually mm. purchase more solar panels mm. at sure. a time. Mm. It's going to be less yeah. expensive for everybody there. Economy scale. Mm. Exactly. That's very interesting. Yeah. So there's a community solar. And love doing those. I'd love to get more. By all means, let me know. We can go ahead and schedule a date for that. Yeah. And that example is what we need to see because that gets a lot more involvement of everybody. It's a community effort, an individual aspect coming together where everybody's moving towards a common goal. And so, by all means, highly encourage that. I'm enthused to do it. And myself, I'm a neutral party in the situation. I'm the hub. I connect everybody together. So I'm not touting one installer over another or one finance company over another. I'm getting the information and helping somebody choose which one's best for them. So there's no particular bias. And that's part of the initiative that I'm putting together and I'm going to be speaking with local governments. Is I'm not here to sell everybody my idea or my panels or my systems. I'm here to sell everybody my idea and my concept to help them facilitate that. Clifford, how does it work in practice um, if we want a solar assessment? Is crew able to send us somewhere to do that? Yep. Or we do that online? Or And how much does that cost? And all the rest of it. An assessment is no charge. I come by, sit down with you, go through your electricity bill, answer any questions. And I take that information, punch it in the system, and I generally come from a second meeting, come down, I have a proposal set out. Here's what it'll, how much solar it'll take. Here's an installer. Here's a finance company. Is this acceptable for you? Like, oh, I've heard of that company. I don't like them. Okay, I can find another installer. Boom, and go from there. And so what, I can help walk somebody through that process. And what criteria do you use in suggesting one installer as opposed to another or one brand as opposed to another? Certification. There's, all right, everybody's familiar with the Better Business Bureau? Yeah. In solar, there's a North American Board of Certified Electrical Practitioners, NABCEP. NABCEP is a third party organization that verifies the quality of work and the installers, are, how well they're doing and how well they're looked at in the industry. Somebody that has their certification has gone through extensive testing and knows what they're doing. So that's my first level. After that, we look at person's opinion. My primary installer is the, they install the largest solar array in Florida, and they do floor, they do arrays around the state, primarily out of Tampa and in Fort Myers here. So that's our primary guy, but if somebody has somebody else in mind, I have no problem putting that together as well. Right. So, because that's, that's one of those things that people run into. So it's a, it's a win-win situation. I see it that way. The yeah. main thing is just getting the information. I don't charge, there's no cost in just doing an assessment. And even after that, uh, I'm taken care of with the system. Whoever does the install takes care of me, so it's no cost to you. It's yeah. not anything additional. They've, got, they've already got that built into everything. So it's no charge. I just help everybody go down that path. All right, so now 
it has been a win-win on everything. And everybody's like, Clifford, all this is too good to be true. Now, every, the only thing you're talking about is positives. What could possibly be the negatives going into this? There's particularly two things that limit solar. Is our flora and fauna. Our trees, which we love to make sure we can maintain, actually become the obstruction right. in using solar. Depending on the height of the tree, that can be shading or obstructing the view of the sun to the roof. All right. If the roof, if the panels can't get sunlight, they can't operate. So that's the main negative for an option of solar. Somebody may have a big, beautiful oak, spruce, you know, pine tree in their front yard, and they're like, "I'm not getting rid of that thing's been there for 80 years." Okay, solar may not be an option because of shading. That's one one thing to look at. Somebody may have a building that's actually shading or obstructing their view. Those are the main things. And then I do get, well, you have to do all this mining to get the silicon, and you have to do the mining to get the metal, so solar is just as dirty as fossil fuels. You know, you, you do have to break an egg to make an omelet, so there is some impact. But the key is, with solar panels, after they're manufactured, impact stops. There's no other pollutants that continue in the environment after the solar mm -hmm. event. And then the panels themselves from the offset of materials that are pumped in from greenhouse gases and the water reduction and the resources that are conserved balances out even the manufacturing process. And that cannot be said for natural gas, oil, or coal. So solar panels still have that advantage. So those are the negatives that do go with it. Now there are also instances where somebody's roof is um, it looks really cool because it's got 3D different levels on it, but that doesn't work well for solar panels being laid onto that roof or the steeple of, or the point of the house may be blocking something else. That is a negative that we do have in the situation. So I like to try to be all encompassing and explain every aspect of it to everybody. But those would be really the only negatives that come into play. Other than that, it's all ups. It's nothing but a win for going solar. So conservation is the key, right? By using solar power, we're conserving our resources, right? Even if we are using the metal, we can use recycled aluminum for the frame. Silicon that's actually used to make the glass and make up the panels is one of the most abundant materials on the planet. So it doesn't take a lot to get into. A lot of people talk about rare earth materials, neodymium, germanium, and things that are used in panels. A lot of that isn't, isn't what we're talking about here. In conventional panels, much of that isn't even used. What that is used in the newer flat panels that they can roll out in sheets and are really flexible, they use some of those rare earth materials. But those, again, aren't manufactured on scale and they're not cost effective for the average homeowner. So going with thin film panels isn't necessarily the best route to go. So it's still using one of the most abundant materials on the planet and using materials that we already have here that can be used from recycled materials as well. So conserving our energy in that respect is one of the key things you can do. There's no pollution after construction. We just touched on that a second ago. Once a power plant's built, it has to get that flow, it has to have that pipeline of energy constantly pumping out greenhouse gases continually, uh, pumping out particulate matter. There's numbers that say uh, 100,000 people die each year because of particulate matter in the air. And a lot of those people that are impacted by are the low, com low income, you know, most vulnerable. They don't necessarily put the power plant down a block away from you, anybody here. And that's kind of a brutal truth, but it's just a reality of a situation. Home prices are generally low around power plants because nobody really wants to live there. So the people that don't have the opportunity to afford you know, better lifestyle end up in those homes. And there's actually just a recent story here in Fort Myers where they were dumping arsenic, I believe it was, yeah, yeah. over in Fort Myers. Uh, in the Dunbar area. Yeah. We're talking about low-income areas. They're the ones that are affected by the byproducts of and these pollutants that are just put in the ground and brushed over. Yeah, and there's new evidence. Uh, I've just been reading. I'm a science writer, so you know this is my area. Um, that there seems to be now uh, a realization that there's also a correlation between Alzheimer's and particulate mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, which is really kind of scary. Right. And we all do breathe the same air. Yeah. Children, children are usually disproportionately 
affected because right. their systems are they're still developing inherently smaller. Right. And they can end up getting damaged at an earlier stage. Right? So if someone's growing up with particular matter, they grow up with asthma, breathing problems, which further restricts the amount of oxygen. The oxygenation of their blood makes their immune system weaker, they're more susceptible to sickness, they're missing school, and I mean, the dominoes just keep going from mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting that pollution out, starting to minimize first. Every little bit is a reduction. Each home that goes solar is saving hundreds of trees, thousands of pounds of particulate, you know, several cubic feet of gas. It takes roughly one million cubic feet of natural gas per month per home, roughly. All right, so it's a lot that's going out there. We really just don't see it because a lot of this is invisible. Mm -hmm. We're breathing it right now and don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. Every year, the amount of oxygen that's actually in the air has been dropping. And anybody remember hyperbaric chambers? Oh, yeah. They were mm -hmm. doing polio, the big thing, put it in a hyperbaric chamber because it has an oxygen rich environment that actually kills bacteria and makes it easier for people's immune system to bounce back. When you go to the hospital, they put you on oxygen because that helps you heal. When we don't have as much oxygen in the air that we're breathing, we're stressing our immune system, making us more susceptible for disease, sickness, and the like. Not to mention the pollution further goes into our water, as we see with our discharges. That's mainly due, due to agricultural reasons, but in other regions, they do have coal ash that throws off the balance of bacteria in our ecosystem. And people don't like bacteria because they're nasty and they're germs, but they're one of the greatest producers of oxygen for everyone. All right, so we really gotta give credit where credit's due. But when they can't survive in an environment, it actually impacts all of us as far as the availability. All right, so reducing fossil fuel use in general is, is key. All right, we can't expect this to happen overnight, but little bits over time consistently will have an overall large effect. So reducing our fossil fuel use, just start by you know, turning off lights, getting energy efficient bulbs, you know, just putting the AC up a little bit higher, a couple degrees, most people won't even notice the difference. You know, just push that, getting a couple fans instead of you know, cranking the AC down. You know, there are tremendous ways we can go through and use that. And at the end of the day, a solar spill, just a nice thing. <laughs> <laughs> In Washington, on June 7th, they actually just had a pipeline explosion. Not really covered by the media. I found two reports uh, because nobody was hurt. So I guess this one didn't bleed, it didn't lead. Because the pipeline explosion happened in a wooded area. And on my Facebook page, there's actually a drone footage of it. And it looks like a small area until you realize the little dots are the people. That drone had to go up. And they say it was about 10 acres that burned because of that, all right? So it's a tremendous, tremendous impact to our environment when these spills and explosions do happen. Because the other thing is, a lot of times they can't just come in and put the fire out. They have to let that burn off, or they have to do what's called venting, where instead of having that gas that's feeding that fire, they just have to cut the pipe in another area and let that gas just shoot off, all right? And that's how they get the fire to burn itself out which is further causing more particulate matter and more carbon dioxide being put in the air. So it's just really a tremendously damaging event when there is a spill, where there is a pipeline break. So we gotta take this into account by avoiding that. Toy solar is one of the key ways to do it. So now our budding future. It's not all downs. Year on year, the growth of solar has been tremendous. Uh, Florida is adopting more solar. The number of 12,000 is down, We're probably up to about 15,000 right now. Um, we can't find out until the new numbers come down each year. But we are on a good trajectory for growing more solar and getting more, more implemented. However, solar only makes up, solar and renewable energy only makes up 1% of our electricity grid. 1%. So even with our tremendous growth year on year, it's only 1%. It's a drop in the bucket. We need more to get into it, get in the game, help us out. Technology is advancing continually. As I mentioned before, the manufacturing of solar panels is becoming more and more efficient. So we have more and more that we can get out of the same material by using less material. So we have that. The biggest advancements we're seeing now is in storage. Storage is 
can be as much as the solar system itself, you know, depending on that. So somebody could have, say, a $20,000 system, their storage could also cost $20,000. You're talking about the batteries. The batteries, correct. Yeah. So it can be, but that pricing has been coming down more and more. Elon Musk's Gigafactory, it's only at about, I want to say, 30 or 40% of its operating capacity. When it reaches 100%, it's going to be pumping out batteries you know, like clockwork, and it's going to further cause the price to come down. He said that he can actually, with seven gigafactories, take care of the entire battery supply for the planet. <laughs> or I think it was for the country. Seven in the United States can take care of the country. I think that's what the number was. And we truly believe that because Australia had a big blackout on their western region. He came in with his batteries, dropped their electricity cost by 90%. 90% and those are the preliminary numbers. So we're starting to see those truly solidify because these offset a lot of the cost of the, exist, the, of the existing costs they had. So it's, the potential is outrageous. Uh, so last thing I'm gonna cover is a solar economy. There is no reason that Florida should not have a solar-based economy. Oil, natural gas, fracking are the standard established status quo, and they're looking to do more of that. They want, they're doing exploratory drilling here in the Everglades. Mm -hmm. Now, if they actually do that, we can say bye-bye to the Everglades. All right, just when they were doing their exploratory test to see about the viability out here, their rigs were getting caught in the mud, and just what they had to do to get them out was just more damaging than actually just leaving them alone. It was just... The impact was tremendous, but we have to look at that as what they're going to do all over the Everglades, because you can't just put in one spot. They put in these wells and derricks and pumps, you know, pot-marked and peppered all throughout. So it's it's just economic, ecologically tremendous burden to put onto the system. So, yeah. do you know who's um, test drilling in the Picayune? Say again. Do you know who is test drilling in the Picayune? Is it? I do Eight. not remember the name of the company. I can find that is out. Is it for, um, what, do you know what it's for? Well, they're trying to see how much natural gas they can get to, it is, where yeah, the main vein it. is, where they should put in the pumps yeah. to pump it out, and where they would do their best fracking. But they're going to be pulling water out of the system to put into that, and this is our drinking water. They're not using, you know, just gray, gray water you know, that we, from our waste management system. They're using our drinking water to pump into the ground, and when it comes out, their, their mix of chemicals to get that fracking done makes that water not mm -hmm. usable. You can't purify that mm -hmm. enough. It, it just it doesn't work out well. Yep. Um, there are two organizations around here who have done tremendous documenting of all of the facts and figures around this. One is called Preserve Our Paradise. And it's run by a woman called Pam Garibaldi, who was associated with um, the Unitarian Church here in uh, Naples. And uh, she gave a very interesting talk on that too, not too long ago. The other one is called the, um, what kind of crab? Oh yeah, the Stone Crab Alliance. Um, and so I think what I'll do is I'll add to the discussion section of the, of the, the website, um, the links to these organizations, so if you want more uh, specific information, uh, you can get it. The other thing, come to think of it, is this Tuesday, up in Fort Myers at the library, there is going to be a bipartisan discussion of the environment, especially water and air, with David Holden, who is a Democrat, and a Republican, who's also working on these issues. So it's going to be a bipartisan discussion of environment. I can, I'll, I'll put that on the uh, website as well. If you're up in, uh, in the Fort Myers area, it might be worthwhile going to hear what they have to say. Because, I mean, unless um, we, our representatives are listening to good sense about all of this and, and not taking donations from people who would like to see us not use solar energy and continue to use you know, gas and mess up the Everglades, um, you know, it, the elections is the only way we can control it. All right. Well, the other yeah. way is just bypassing them all together. One yeah. thing you do you're find right. is you're that right. energy right. issues yeah. cross party lines. They say about 30% of Democrats have gone solar. 
about 30% of Republicans have gone solar. About 30% of libertarians, and the number keeps going out, about a third of every political organization has gone solar, no matter what their size is. That's generally what the numbers balance out to. So it crosses all lines. It's not something that's a Republican, Democrat, or any particular party issue. These are energy issues that affect us all, and we all can do steps towards that. Much of the work we're doing is not politically affiliated at all. So I highly encourage checking out those meetings and talking to those people. There's also gonna be a forum uh, August 1st for sea level rise. So that's something else that comes into play just as far as water, uh, salt water infiltration and you know, threats to our coastal areas. Naples in particular, when, during Irma, when the storm surge came in, we had a lot of waste that actually bubbled up. And I have some people that I've come in contact with, they, can't, they couldn't move back into their homes because the waste contaminated their home to the point it was condemned. All right, so all their belongings, all their things done. And that's just because the water rose up too high. All right, that's not even a giant tidal wave like they like to talk about and great stuff we see in movies day after tomorrow or when the world ends or whatever cool destruction movie there is nowadays. But these are nice, or not nice, but these are very underestimated aspects that end up kicking in and causing our biggest problems. All right, so with that, we open up to questions. Wow. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. The first is, um, is the voltage amplified to accommodate our 220 appliances? Ah. Yes. What you have is coming into the home, you have two lines that are 120. And what they do is they combine those two lines to get the 220 that you have for your dryers or anything else that's using that, your ovens, things along those lines. But yes, it, it covers both, both portions of the grid for that home. So no, literally nothing really changes because your appliances don't care. What, electricity doesn't care where it, co where it comes from, whether it's from the sun or whether it's from fossil fuel. It's here to do the work and everything's designed just as normal. The only thing real dis difference is that you have these cool crystals on your roof. Everything else continues as normal. Switches over, changes automatically. And what was your second, second one? My second question is, um, I live in a house that's basically a knockdown. In other mm -hmm. words, it's an older house that's on a nice lot that if it were sold, they would knock it down and build a little mini mansion. Mm -hmm. right. Um, right. So, how, so how practical is it for me to put solar panels on my roof thinking, well, it's going to increase the value of my house when in fact my house has no value only my there you go. Right. In a case like that, it may not be practical. It may not be cost effective. All right. Um, and that's just a reality. And I, I don't like to sugarcoat too much, you know, but uh, if you plan on staying there for a while, it'd be something to, something to consider. But if it's a knockdown and you're looking to move, it may not be the best route to go to use solar. An energy management system might be better in that case. You say 10 years or 20 years or three years? Uh, it depends on how long you plan on being there. If you plan on being there, you know they're going to knock it down and you're going to be there 10 years. In 10 years, you can have the system paid off and okay. everything can go just fine. But also in 10 years, you sell to a couple that's not going to knock it down. It might be a good idea. Yeah. But then it may not be. It may not be the best route to go with. Because even if you did recycle those panels and take them off and somebody used them in another system, they're they're used and there's not as good resale value or uh, what's the word? It's not really what somebody's looking for. It might be good to put them up there and then donate those panels to something else or somebody else. Right there. Oh. But I'd love to see happen. I'd love to see you go solar either way. <laughs> so would I. Uh, okay. uh, you believe me, how did you next? Uh, if, for example, you're going to have like a category five storm. Yeah. And I think sometimes the power companies does selectively turn off the power for safety reasons. Yes. If you've got solar panels on your roof. Do you have to worry about going out there and turning off your circuit breakers, or does the power company take care of all that? No. Like just simply cutting down everything? There's two routes to go on that. You'll have an automatic shutoff in your system that you can actually have in your garage. It's just like you go to your main box, you can flip the panel and turn everything off. It'd be another safety switch you can go and just turn there. Mm -hmm. Or the system will automatically shut down when the power from the utility kicks off. You would want to turn off, if that happened, you'd want to go through and turn off your shutdown switch just so you don't get a back feed. Mm -hmm into it, and that's just a safety precaution. So I know when we had the hurricane, they cut the power, we cut our power, our main breaker off. Also, 
because you don't want that, once the power is restored, that fast ramp up and you blow out something else in your circuit or you damage some other electrical equipment that you have attached to it. So as a precaution, if you know what's going to happen and you know they're cutting it, when they cut it, shut your switch or you can just shut down your switch beforehand and just go with utility power, wait for them to cut it and then go down when everybody else goes down. Now if you're having some electrical work done in your house where you have to turn the power off, just a, a place, an hour, a couple hours, it, it's not gonna cause any backup or power surge or anything like that? No, it's not gonna cause any power surge, but uh, whoever's doing your electrical work, they'll know, they need to know that you have a solar system and take whatever precautions they would need to to make sure that they're, they're gonna be safe doing their work. Because you know, if it's on the back of the house, they didn't see it coming up, and then they go and start doing work, they think they're okay because they hit one switch. You know, that could be. What's a, a good website we should, if we want to learn more? Um, you can grab my card and have them on the back table. Okay. There, or if you're looking for an assessment, be sure to put your information on the clipboard. You got a question? With the uh, net metering, so how does all that that part work? I mean, I know they're not in the business, mm -hmm. like you're saying, of buying the electricity mm -hmm. or, or wanting to, but I mean, they, they do do that. Right. right. So, because usually during the day, maybe you're not at home using any electricity, but that's when your <laughs> panels are generating it. So obviously you want to get credit as it's going out. And then mm -hmm. at night when you come in and turn on the air and turn on, you know, get your baths and use the hot water, right. then you're starting to use it. So uh, I know, I think it was, on the website where the lady said she has it and they don't like I think she said once a year they give you right. know the money back or whatever it's so called a true up. That work? they do a true up now first off your meter is a bi-directional meter mm -hmm. so we can tell when your electric mm -hmm. how much electric is going in which direction mm -hmm. so it's keeping track of how much you produce how much they you used from them so the second step is that it measures credits throughout the year and it will track that till it comes to your annual, where they do the true up. Say, so, hey, you overproduced by uh, 2,000 kilowatt hours, so we're cutting you a check for $200. And then what she wanted to do is just keep letting the credit roll over and not cash in the check. But they don't like that. I know one guy, he said they can't force him to cash the check, so he just lets his checks accumulate. And Hey, you have whatever battle you have with that. Uh, the checks do get old, so that money that might just end up not being there. They just took it into their account and said, hey, we didn't have to pay you. You didn't cash the check. Uh, I don't know how that ended up. But what they do do the tracking for that. And at the end of each year, they'll let you know, hey, you have a check for this much for your extra power to be used. And then their meter tracks how much is going which direction. So. And then you said also with the battery, so there, can there be a, a like a dual system? where you can have enough battery that you just want to pay for, for like you said, maybe one day of bad weather. Absolutely. But then how does that work with, it knows to tap your batteries first before it goes out then to get more power. Correct. So it'll fill up your batteries, and then when your batteries get depleted, it's going to switch over to utility power. And all that's done automatically. The thing about batteries is many cases people would go and use a generator, and they'll spend 20,000, 30,000 on that generator. But that generator is only used in emergencies. Yeah. Batteries, for roughly the same amount, are used daily. And the batteries will operate for 10, 12, some may even say 20 years. So instead of having that generator that only used once, yeah. and then you get the horror stories that when they did need it that one time, it didn't even work. You know, they spent all the money for that. I've heard that story a lot too. But uh, using batteries, whichever level, you're using that, whether it's just for emergency power, one day of autonomy, or two days of autonomy, it's going to use all the energy first, and then you cut into the utility afterwards. So it's so, no matter what cost effectiveness. Well, when you were saying before, so you were, uh, you know, it said when the power company goes down, you go down. Well, can't you go switch the breaker and just use your battery? Correct. If you have batteries. If you have batteries, okay. that's what the case. So you you become an island. Okay. Because you have power and everybody else doesn't. You're in a sea of no power if you're the only, you're the only light. Mm -hmm. And that's only if you have batteries or some storage level in the system. There's there's different ways that people store energy. That's why we kind of flip between this, there's a number of the batteries. term storage and the term batteries. For most one, residential one applications, day. it's going to be batteries. Maybe two days. But with the, the batteries, and they're going to take care of your power for you. The and you'll be good. You'll still have the island, so that way you're not damaging or causing any threat to anybody so outside of your home. Weeks, yeah. But you'll be able to use those on a daily basis. 
and that way you're actually getting mileage out of them as opposed to a generator, which only it just sits there. So you have 20 grand, you just put that in a case and just look at it. There's much more grand. You know, batteries at least you're using it. How many recharge it? I lived in Switzerland for most of my life, and there the electrical company. No. Um, gave us a break okay. on uh, electricity so. cost when we ran it at night as opposed to during the day. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that if Peter and I get something like this, we're going to have to reorient our minds completely and use maximum power during the day when the sun mm -hmm. is shining. And, and sort of like run our dishwasher during the day, running, running our washing machine during the day. Doesn't that make sense? And then ease back on the power at night? That does make sense from a conservation aspect, but what they're gonna look at is your overall kilowatt, mm -hmm. kilowatt hours used. Mm -hmm. It would probably make more sense to do it during the day when your system's going. Yeah, um, especially if, that's only if you haven't got a battery. Right. But what you want to look at is your power usage. It might also be better to use it at night because you're building up credits during the day and you're using your credits up at night. Oh, goodness. Okay. So it might, it, it probably would end up being the opposite of what you would think. Ah. It'd be better to use it at night. And that's also huh. less usage because most people are, aren't using power as much. So you have lower power costs. Off peak. Off peak hours, right. So you're using off peak. So, um, they generally go off kilowatt hours, the first 500 for FPNL, the second 500, and the third 500, and the price it goes up incrementally. If you're using all your energy during the, if you're producing more energy during the day, you're building up credits, it makes more sense to use it at night from the utility company because you're not cutting into your kilowatt hours. So a lot of this is not immediately obvious to a layperson. <laughs> right. You really need uh, an assessment. Could you tell us a little bit more about if you don't go for solar panels, then you should look at, uh, was it electricity management? Energy management energy. system. Could you explain a little right. bit about that? Uh, what we have is an energy management system that, okay, all the appliances create interference in your electrical grid. I think I, I left it, I left it at my house. All right, uh, I'm kicking myself right now. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 that's not your fault, that's mine. What we have right here, this is called an EMI meter, electromagnetic interference meter. And about May, we plug this in, and you have about 419 millivolts of interference that's coming into your electricity lines right now. That's because the refrigerator is running, um, I have my computer on, all these are going to cause small interferences throughout. An energy management system filters out this interference. In most cases, it reduces it 80 to 95, 90, even as high as 99 percent, which means everything's going to run more efficiently, and it'll drop your overall energy consumption between 10 percent, and we've seen as high as 30 percent. So, for, uh, I'm still kicking myself right now. But uh, if we, if I had that meter, you could actually see the actual reduction for you specifically. But a system like that might be more cost effective because that system will reduce your overall energy. It will make your home run more efficiently. So it's not, it doesn't have that interference bogging it down, making your TV run a little bit harder, your lights run a little bit hotter for that. So it will make everything run cooler. So that's what we refer to as an energy management system, taking out that interference. So somebody who, for some reason, can't have roof panels Correct. That would be sort of the next thing to look at just to save the environment and save money. And Correct. Yeah. Say if somebody had an apartment. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they, can't, they can't add solar panels. An energy management system would go in. And we have them, uh, my demonstration unit is actually a wall plug-in where you just plug it right into the wall socket and everything on that portion of the circuit will get filtered. For our average home, there's two lines coming in, 120 and 120, they combine for that 220. You would need one plug-in for one section, another plug-in for the other section. For somebody that has solar on their home, we actually wire that in at the junction box. Uh -huh. So that's a different application, but we do our best to accommodate whatever situation somebody may be. So in. when you get solar panels, you get that as well? We include that as an option uh, in the system. Oh, okay. Not mandatory, but we highly, highly recommend that. Because what that does is it makes the system 10% more efficient without having to add any more panels to it.
So I, I would include it as a standard, but that's something that I'm able to provide as a company and depending on what installer, you may or may not want to use it for whatever reason they would have. So that's why we have that, that off. Uh, going back to that part actually where she was talking about doing stuff during the day and instead of at night. Mm -hmm. so, but, um, so during the day when you're not using it and you're giving it to FPL and then you need it back at night, do you get yours back or is there still an upcharge? Mm -hmm. well, um, they look at the tracking as far as the kilowatt hours used. They don't care when it was done. We don't have particular peak hours. But uh, from an environmental standpoint, during the day when everybody's running their AC is a peak. So you don't want to use it then because you're just adding to the ramping up of the energy usage. So you can see it at night would be an off-peak time. So everybody else's systems are generally turned down lower, the AC isn't cranked up, things along those lines. So you're, it's a less of a footprint if you use it at that time. FPNL or LCEC only looks at the kilowatt hours used. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they look at so it. That's why you're yeah. saying it doesn't matter. She doesn't need to do all of her laundry at no. noon. She can right. still do it at 8 o'clock at night if that's when she likes to do it because <clears throat> right. it's, it's not going to matter. She's generating electricity. Sure. She's getting it right. back. But from an environmental standpoint, rather than doing it and using it when everybody else is using it, right. using it at yeah, night would be yeah. you know, less damaging to the environment because it's already off peak. And the kilowatt hours are determined by the meter. By the meter. So if it's incoming, the meter ramps up. If it's outgoing, if you are producing power and pushing it back onto the grid, then you'll drive your meter backwards mm -hmm. so the number will go down. Right. Or you drive it backwards <clears> slower because <throat> you're using it at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, if right. somebody wants to look at it from that level, by all means. If somebody didn't want to and just do their everyday stuff as normal, that's still an option too. Don't think you have to change everything, but if you want to, you know, get hardcore about it, by all means, I encourage it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, there, you said there's a couple of components to the system. There's the panels, mm -hmm. and then there's an inverter. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then there's, a, is there another, a bi-cat or? Uh, that's the bi-directional meter. Bi-directional mm -hmm. meter, okay. Right. And that goes between the uh, FPL meter and the house? Well, it is or? your FPL meter. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right now, for most homes, you have a standard smart meter, mm -hmm. all right? So they would replace the smart meter for a bi-directional meter. Is that still kind of a smart meter or not anymore? It is. It's still a smart meter. It's just one that can read the electricity in two different directions. Okay, so when this is installed, you have a full permit. Correct. And does FPL get notified that you're putting um, panels on your house? Yes. They're notified because they have to make sure that the system is going to not damage the utility grid. Okay. And they have a special system that, by law, they have to do the net metering. So whenever you do net metering, you have to let them know, hey, I'm doing net metering, so that way they know to look at your line specifically to make sure it, the net meter is operating properly. And you're saying they're cre they credit you at the wholesale rate? Or? At a wholesale rate. Generally, it's about half. Um, I don't know specifically. You'd have to look at your specific situation, what the numbers come down to, because they have particular, you know, different criteria that affects the value. For most cases, it comes at about four and a half, four point five, four point seven cents, mm -hmm. whereas okay. standard is about ten to four to eleven point one cents. And after you do your analysis and determine like 10 kilo, kilo, uh, kilowatt hours or array or something like that. 10 kilowatt array. Is there limits to how, how, how many you can put on? Can you go 15, 150% of your usage? Right. So that you always get credited back every month? If you go too, hot, too, hot, too high, you're considered a utility, <laughs> and all of a sudden you open up <laughs> another level of complication. Yeah. Okay. It starts the first, uh, Three to ten kilowatt hours is a tier one system. The tier two system is uh, ten point one to I want to say fifteen, or ten point one to hundred kilowatt hours, and then hundred kilowatt hours or more is a tier three system. So once you get into that area, most homes are going to be in the under ten kilowatt hours, but a home with a pool or something could be in the twelve or fourteen kilowatt uh, kilowatt system size. So they'd be a tier two system. So there's different criteria at each stage. So, so what's that tier different. two system mean? It just means there's more rigmarole they have to go through for the energy production coming in from the home. They have to make sure the system's more robust and the wiring can handle the 10 kilowatt hour, or the 12 kilowatts that's coming through it, that the meter will have the proper safety features to kick into place, and the amount of power coming through isn't turning you into a utility being in competition 
competitor for them. So would it be better then to put your pool on a separate solar thermal system rather than the photovoltaic? It may. It may. If you already have an electric heat pump, the way they would end up doing is the primary, the primary use that the electricity would be done for is that heat pump because that's going to be your largest heat drain or your largest electricity drain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So the solar panels end up focusing its, focusing its energy off that. So you essentially take that portion off of your electricity bill. So it's a matter yeah, of. Yeah, I don't have heating right now, and I was thinking of putting a thermal, a solar mm -hmm. thermal on. But then mm -hmm. if I was looking at this, then I was thinking, well, I could just put the whole system on, but it may be better to do them separately. Right. Depending on the orientation of your roof, you might want to do solar thermal. Is that way you don't have that a jump in electricity to heat the pool? But then it also might be, well, it's more cost effective to put the photovoltaic, which has a dual use. It'll heat the pool, offset that cost, and any excess will take care of the house too. What's the difference of lifespan between the, the solar thermal and the solar electric? Solar thermals generally are replaced in a seven to 10 year range. Solar electric is generally goes 25 to 30. So that's a consideration. It is. Yeah. It's a matter of what you're using it for. And then at the same time, if you want to turn off your electric heat pump on your pool, all the electricity that the panels are using is just focusing on the house. So there's there's some things to go through, and that's why it helps to have somebody that's at least seen it a couple times to help walk somebody through this. Because a lot of people hear that, see that, and they're like, oh man, this is just too much. Forget it. You know? So they get that. Paralysis through analysis. <laughs> hmm? What other questions we have there? Yes, sir. Uh, can you add like 50% of like five kilowatt hour system and then maybe a year or two later add another? Absolutely. Five? Their systems are very Lego like. So if you can even add a certain amount now, then add more later. You can add batteries now and add more batteries later. Build the system up over time. Yeah. All right, so. Ideally, you know, it's like getting headlights for your car. You really want to get them at the same time because it really shares the brightness. It's all stay the same. But there's nothing that says you can't get this one and then wait six months to get the other one. So, yeah, by all means, it's like, like do it in stages, do it in phases, build it up, whatever somebody can to, you know, help their situation. So, keep asking questions. But I'm, I'm here for that. Um, we have. Um, uh, homeowners around here who are very rational thinkers mm -hmm. and um, if we wanted to get like four or five families together for mm -hmm. you to do a presentation <coughs> then each one would have to, to give to submit to you uh, digitally their what their electricity bills are so that you could get a sense of it or would you need to look at each house and etc well I would need the electricity bill to determine their energy profile to see right. how much energy each home is using Right. From there, and an address, the lovely eyes of Google helped me see every home. Oh, it's so good. Right. So, <laughs> the governor is watching. So, us, that's right. Yeah. But they do have that as open, and there's the satellite images allow me to see most everybody's roof. There's right. very few homes that aren't available on that. So we can see from there mm -hmm. how much sunlight's hitting the roof. And that's just with the address alone. There's a lot of information I can gather from that. but. It can be dialed in better just because you're seeing this much doesn't mean your house is using this much. So I could end up over, do, oversizing the system or undersizing right, the system. Right, right. That's why the electricity bills come into play. Now I can tailor it specifically for So you system. wouldn't need to actually walk around each house. You could just we could just have a meeting with yeah. a bunch of people and you could talk about one meeting, what would be everybody bring their electricity <laughs> bills. Right. Okay. I can knock it out in one in one session. You should be able to scale the number of square feet on the roof and blah blah off from Google Earth. And oh right, so, right. Yeah. But like I said, my scaling could be off depending you on. You how don't have to be walking on the roof and getting oh, wires no, no, and no, 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 utility no. trucks and so on. No, you no, should be I able. To, I mean, plus or minus what five or ten percent or whatever. Exactly. exactly. <clears throat> you should be able to scale it right off from Google. Earth. Yeah, and when we write the proposals, we generally want to be in the eighty-five to one hundred percent range, and then then there's some give. You don't want to necessarily have the system designed for 100. Mm. It might be 110 mm. or, you know, the flexibility in that. So but generally, when you go a little bit under, it keeps the utility happy. So we're not trying to start a battle, you know, slow mm. progress or times better than just thumbing your nose. Come on, you know, let's be, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't need to do all that. You know, so, yeah, we would just, ideally, we want to just go to blackout, cover 100% of your power. Now, my home, 
I have potential to do 120%. I'm looking at 120% because I'm going to be getting an electric car. So that's going to be added. So I'm looking at sizing it now rather than waiting. You know, but I have to make sure I don't get an electric car two years down the road because I'm going to like, well, for, we're going to put pressure on you or some <laughs> mighty hand, you know, conspiracy level theory, conspiracy theory <laughs> level stuff. Um, but you generally, as a designer, want to shoot for just getting a blackout 100%. Yeah. Theoretically, you could go bigger, but, you know, why overdo it? It's generally not cost effective to go more, and we don't want to ruin, ruin people's budgets. So, go from there. What else we got? Burning questions. Hit me. I have a question. Sure. So, being that you have to tie in to the grid, mm -hmm. and you can have a switch to go island if there was uh, an event that caused the blackout. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had batteries, can you not just have that switch so you're an island all the time, or the, the electric company see that? The electric company would see that because all of a sudden your meter's running, and all of a sudden your meter's not. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they look at that, but it's not one of the things they're going to be. As soon as you do it in like two hours, they come to your door. Hey, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, but they'll see it over time. Hey. This person was using this much energy, a red flag would pop up because you're not using any energy at all mm -hmm. and you're a solar system. Is there a problem? Because that's the first thing they're doing if they want to make sure there's no issue. Mm -hmm. You know, so going from there. Uh, they, they can see a lot of information from the flow of energy. Mm -hmm. I lived in Arizona and what you had in Arizona is a lot of homes that were second homes in areas that were developing. So what they found is that all of a sudden these second homes had a huge spike in their energy consumption. Lo and behold, they were, they were turned into grow houses. So, <laughs> just from the energy usage, the police were able to tell which house was the grow house. There's the garden connection, right? And there's the yeah. garden connection, exactly, you know? Hydroponics and everything. But had they had solar, they could have balanced that out and never really seen that. I'll just say. Well, I'm not looking to go to the house. But my point in that story is that they can see a lot of information just from the power flow. Yeah. And I lose track of time. I can just talk. <laughs> <laughs> so.